Yeah, can I? My lathe's pretty rigid, but can it turn high-speed steel? I had a bit of a look on the Practical Machinist forum, but didn't get a lot of information about it, so let's give it a go. This is edited from one of my live streams. Yeah, g'day guys. What are we trying to do here today? Well, before I start, let's have a bit of a chat about um, what's been going on in the last month or so. The Bolly lathe sold, so that was really nice. A really nice gentleman from up in about an hour and a half north of Vienna came down and, and bought it. Yeah, the only accessories I didn't sell with it was the nice forge or chuck. And that was because I'd already promised it to a gentleman in Germany who did an amazing job of a Bolly 4L restoration. And the other thing, you remember I had a shop tour of my mate Stefano's workshop in Chicago and also a video on his electronic lead screw? Well, Stefano started uploading videos, so go and check that out. And the last thing before I start this week's video, I was contacted by Jerome in France, who's a brass instrument maker. Um, he's got a 125 CNC, but he's moved up to a 180 Schoblin, and he'd like to sell this machine. It's got some sort of a DOS retrofit. If you're interested, I'll have a link below to Jerome's website. You might have seen during my video review of Luke's workshop that he had a wall holder, but also a D'Andrea boring and facing head. Well, he also had this very nice Narex VHU. 80 boring heads he had he agreed to sell it to me which I really appreciated so when he came up to Vienna he bought it up with him gave me a really really generous price on it as well which was nice of him the one thing is I don't have an arbor for it because it I think uh, it had a um, number four morse arbor down when he bought it which is no use to me Narex typically uses an adapter flange bolted onto here which is about 110 diameter probably 15 millimeters thick and then they have a, a huge flange on the bottom of a, of a 40 taper arbor and just put four bolts down into that intermediate flange and I was thinking of doing that which I wasn't really happy about because turning down a 110 slug of steel down to this taper would be a, a huge waste of steel and would take forever. What Luke pointed out to me was that there's a thread down in here. Wallholpter does the same sort of mounting but with just a normal sized uh, arbor and a stud with a differential thread on it. At first I thought you know holding this whole heavy tooling head with just a single stud would be a bit dodgy but Let's be honest, that's the way Wallhopter does it, and they sure as hell know what they're doing. So that got me thinking, or got me designing. The thread in the Narex is an M28 by 1.5, which is convenient because that's what we had to make for the pulley extractor, which you saw in last week's video. There's a 30 millimeter diameter alignment boss on it, and then the sh there's space in the arbor body to do I think I'll probably drop this down to a 24 millimeter actually, a 24 millimeter by 2.5 thread. Then both being right hand threads, you can just screw the, the, the stud straight into the um, body here. You can screw the arbor down, oh, the, the, sh yeah, the arbor down on top of it, but only as far as till you get to these, these drive keys. I'll make up an, an arbor or shank which is hollow. So once it goes down and aligns with those drive keys, then by going with an allen key down the middle, if I unscrew at the bottom, it'll be backing out by one and a half millimeters for each full rotation of the screw. Because this is screwing from the other side, this will be pulling down by two and a half millimeters for each rotation of the screw, giving me effectively one millimeter of reduction in gap for each, each rotation of the screw. These keys are only about two and a half millimeters high, so I should only need sort of two and a half rotations of the differential screw to pull it up tight and clamp it. So that's one of the things I've got planned. The reason we're here today is I'm gonna need a hex in here. And to make a hex, I need a rotary brooch broaching tool. The rotary brooch which uh, Luke made for me oh, quite a while ago now takes 10 millimeter shanks, but the stock which I was given very generously by Christian is this stuff. 1.3207 
and this is like a high speed steel E. It's known in America as M48 ANSI. It's got like 10% cobalt, 10% tungsten in it. It's supposed to be hard as buggery. I don't know exactly what heat treat this, these particular sticks of it are, but it seems to be normally heat treated between Rockwell C64 even as high as 67. So that's gonna be quite a challenge to get this uh, to work, but that's what we're here for today. I went through this morning and set up most of the lathe, but I haven't cut the stuff yet. I figured that'd be more fun to do it together because in the care package I got from Christian, there were also two of these cubic boron nitride cutting tips. Both of them new, so I've got in total I've got four tips to play with. I actually do have, a, in a different size, I also have a couple that I bought. The idea here is we're going to try this out and see whether the Schaublin with these CBN inserts is going to be stiff enough to actually cut one of these M48 blanks. Okay, so where are we at here? So I've set this up looking at about uh, 35 millimeters of stick out. Let me just go and check my compressor. I think it must have faulted out. What am I thinking of? It's not the compressor. I'm still in e-stop here. Now it's working. The main air valve only opens on this once you activate the machine. So now if I hit the, hit the foot switch, that's good. Part 35 millimeters collet, collet is closed, tool is tight. It'd be kind of cool to put an HDMI splitter up into here so that I could feed this monitor out into my live streams as well. But uh, yeah, don't hold your breath. I'm, I'm just happy if I can get anything to work at this stage. I did do a test this morning. This here is a leftover hardened steel rail that I made my um, 3D printer out of. I did use this to touch off the tool and get it all set up. The finish is just unbelievable. I can't feel anything with my finger, anything different to the to the ground piece that they that came from the manufacturer. Uh, the first pass is gonna cut air because I don't want anything bad to happen on the first pass while it's still accelerating the spindle. This is one issue with the lathe macros which were programmed by Andy Pugh is there's no delay to let the spindle spool up to speed. And here I'm gonna be working around 3000 rpm which is my max spindle speed. It does take a few seconds for the thing to spool up. So that's why I'm setting it a little bit oversized and having the first pass cutting air because it'll, it'll race off and start cutting straight away. And I don't want to be cutting at low surface speed into this material. Here goes nothing. Eighteen to go. All right. Well, that's what you get a Schaublin for, huh? Man, that surface finish looks amazing. Just to answer the comment there, um, am I using constant surface speed mode? Yes, I am. So you might have heard it slightly speed up between each pass. I mean, they're only the increments are only point one five of a millimeter. That's probably on the th on the low side of the acceptable range of cut for these inserts. I wanted to be conservative at the start. At this diameter, we got up to about two thousand eight hundred RPM, and it'll get, it'll be probably about three thousand one hundred once it gets down to the ten millimeters. This should have stopped at thirteen millimeters. And when I set it up on the other stock, I did notice that. I got a somewhat different diameter than I'd set. And I think, you know, the, the harder the material, the more sort of spring back you're expecting and stuff. So out on the end. Yeah, so out on the end, I'm basically perfectly on, on dimension. And, well, there's actually 13 microns of taper just over that short length. Like, I wonder if it'll work with just doing a spring pass at the end. Maybe I wasn't quite on it straight. Nine micron of taper by the looks of it. I'll up that depth of cut just a little bit. So that was 0 0.15, I'll go up to 0.2. I'm also doing a half a hundredth per revolution of uh, Ford feed. So I think I'm gonna leave that. I think that was looking okay. Temperature, I mean, theoretically, it should be cold. 
It is. It's barely warm. In fact, it's, it's probably had a temperature rise of only sort of 5 to 10 degrees is what I'm guessing. They say that with hard turning, it's not really a cutting process. Um, Andy Pugh did a good video on it a few years ago, and as he described it, it's more like a single point grinding process. It's rubbing so hard that it overheats the material and plasticizes the material just ahead of the, the cutting point such that you, you normally soften to like uh, HS, HRC 30 to 40 just ahead of the cutting tool but all of the heat should go out into the swarf and not into the into the part. Okay let's um, change the diameter now and go into 12. I need 25 millimeters of 10 millimeter diameter to fit into here and then the total length should be 44 millimeters. So I'm going to need to do a second. I'll, I'll have to stick this out a bit, touch off again, and bring it up to, the, to 44. I wonder what high speed steel pot scrubbers work like. Let's check that diameter again. What size hex tool am I aiming for? I'm aiming for a M10 I think it was. I'm going to end up with a 14 millimeter hole clear down the, the bore of this thing as far as I know. Yeah, it's an M16 threads, which has an M14 minor diameter. So that's a 10 millimeter Allen key. I was gonna turn it to 12 and then grind down the hex from there. What are your thoughts on the rotary broaching tool's ability to cut such a, an M10 hex? Do you think it's uh, realistic? Anyway, this needs to go down smaller. Shall I up the depth of cut? So now it's gonna do 0.25 of a millimeter per pass. Okay, just based on the geometry this time it did actually do a spring pass, it did cut a wee bit. Okay, I'm um, 6 microns oversize now, that's kind of an annoying place to be really. Yeah, so that's unlikely to fit into the, into the tool. And I've got about four, 4 or 5 microns of taper. Yeah. Now I need to go down another few microns. Go aiming for 9.99. One one hundred under should be fine. It's easy to get a bit carried away with um, thinking in microns. They really are kind of a tiny little measurement, aren't they? The other thing too is it could it may just be that the pack cooled down. Because once, you, once you're measuring in microns, temperature makes a big difference. You know, now we are 9 microns under nominal, so this should hopefully fit. Yep, great. Okay, that's a nice fit. Next up, I need to move out touch off again and then cut the larger diameter to 12. I'll set that straight away. Could probably even be slightly lower but I'll do the last bit with when I grind the hex. I need a total length of 44. Out there should be fine. Let me just grab an end mill. Touch off on the end there.
I'm pretty happy with that. That that second dimension's not as critical as the first one because it's all going to get ground away anyway when I make the hex. But uh, I'm glad to see that it works. The surface finish is just spectacular. Oh, that's done. Yeah, it looks like the surface finish now is better than as manufactured. That's pretty impressive. So what does that insert look like after all that abuse? Definitely some visible wear. Hardly surprising considering what it had to do. This is definitely not something I'll be using every day of the week because these inserts are very expensive, but it's cool to know you can solve a problem like this if necessary. So I was pretty happy with how that all worked out. After the live stream, I did a second one and chopped them both off. And if you regularly watch my videos, you know I did one last week making a new grinding wheel cover for my tool and cutter grinder and then trying it out by grinding up one of these into a rotary brooch. And I'm pretty happy with how it came out. So look for a future video where I'll try this out. So if you enjoyed this, I'd appreciate if you'd join me on Patreon or members. It's a great way to support the channel. I really do appreciate it. Thanks to all of Patreon's members and other supporters of my, my little channel here. I really, really appreciate it. Luke and Christian, thanks a lot for the, for the care packages you guys sent over lately. This is cool. Really enjoying it. Anyway, thanks for watching. Catch you next time.